their interfaces. Okay, uh, interface is one of those words that sort of unfor unfortunately can depend a couple different things depending on how you use it. Interfaces are Java's way of getting around the issue of multiple inheritance. All right. If you remember when we talked about classes and subclasses, we said that a class um, can only have one superclass. All right. And that goes all the way up. There can be a chain of subclasses which have superclasses, and then that class can have a superclass and so on. But you can't have you can't inherit from two classes. All right? You're just not allowed to. So if we were writing a system and we had birds, all right? Um, if we, let, let's say we had uh, let, let's say we had an eagle and we were trying to decide what an eagle should inherit from. All right? Maybe it should inherit from bird. All right, but you could also say, well, couldn't it inherit from a class of feathered things? Yeah, it could. Couldn't it inherit from a class of things that fly, flying things? Yes, it could. But clearly, in terms of attributes and behaviors, typically there's going to be one of them that stands out. Like, okay, yeah. An eagle, yeah, is a thing that flies, and an eagle is a thing with feathers. But if we're looking in terms of behaviors and attributes, it's probably most correct to say that an eagle is a bird, right? In other words, an eagle shares more things in common with birds than it does with other flying things, like frisbees and kites and airplanes and helicopters and rockets and other things that fly. So therefore, it would be best to put eagles under birds. Likewise, an eagle shares more behaviors with birds than it would with feathered things. All right, um, down-filled jackets, uh, pillows, fancy pens. All right, so therefore, yeah, it is a feathered thing, but it's probably most correct to say that an eagle is a bird. It, that's the strongest is a relationship, speaking in object-oriented terms. Now, sometimes, though, there are advantages that we can have and we can take by considering it one of those other things. All right? Now, the bird's kind of a, a, a goofy example, but let's talk about, like, say, at an organization. Let, let's say at a college. Um, a college, you could have faculty. And subclasses under faculty could be adjunct faculty, uh, retired faculty, all right? And that's fair because retired faculty is a faculty member. Part-time faculty is a faculty member, so it passes the is a test. We could talk about students, and we could talk about college credit plus students, or we could talk about uh, transient students. We could talk about international students. All right, and they are all share things in common with students. We could talk about the cost, the, the 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 vendors of of LC. In other words, who we buy our supplies from, who we buy um, our you know computer equipment from, and who we purchase the food for the cafeteria for, and and other supplies. Those are our vendors. Uh, we could talk about. Um, corporate customers of LC. In other words, if you contract training. All right. Now, all of those things share some things in common. Right? For example, all of them we might want to send an email to. All right. We might want to send an email to all those different groups of people. The students, faculty, customers, and vendors. We might want to send text alerts to if there's an emergency, like the campus closing or whatever. All right. We might want to send an LC News newsletter to all those people. Yet it doesn't really make sense. That's really the only things that maybe those different groups of people will have in common. So that's sort of a weak is a relationship. 
it's not really worth it to create superclasses and subclasses just because they share the behavior that they get that 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 they all get email. All right? Can I help you or she asked me to come help bring it. Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. Do I need to do anything special? So what do you do in a case like that, when you have multiple things that something could inherit from, but you can only pick one? Well, logically, you pick the one that makes sense. So for example, in our case here, you could create a structure that looks similar to this. You could create faculty. And maybe you have adjunct faculty and retired faculty. And maybe you have students. And maybe you have college credit plus students and international students. And then maybe you have the vendors of LC. And then maybe there's special kind of vendors or, or not or whatever. All right. If all of them share a behavior, for example, all of these share maybe one or two simple behaviors. Like, for example, maybe all of them receive uh, email notifications from LC saying that the class, the, the class is canceled or, or whatever, or the school's closed because of weather, or parking lot's closed, or whatever. All right? If they share that behavior, and that's the only behavior they share, you don't necessarily want to try, you, first of all, you can't try multiple inheritance. So I couldn't have something like this, where I had an email recipient and these guys inherited from that as well, because that would be inheriting from two super classes, and you're not allowed to do that. It really wouldn't even be worth it to create a parent class up here, because those things, that's the only thing they have in common. So therefore, typically what you do is you develop what is called interfaces. All right? So in order to discuss interfaces, let's go back and discuss abstract classes and abstract methods. Because interfaces share a lot in common with abstract classes and, ab uh, and abstract methods. What is an abstract class? Right. Yeah. Library materials is would be an example of an abstract class. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it can have declared methods. It can have attributes as well. All right. The idea of an abstract class is this that things in the real world don't exist on that level. There's always a subclass involved, right? There's always going to be a subclass involved. So for example, a pet. You know, yes, people have pets, but more specifically, people have dogs, cats, birds, fish, and so on. If someone were to ask you, well, what kind of pet do you have? You wouldn't say, well, I simply have a pet. It's not a dog or a cat, it's just a pet. Well, what kind of pet? No, nah, that's it. It's just a pet. That doesn't make sense for a real world thing. So with an abstract class, let me create a class called A and a class called B. And A is an abstract class and B is not. If it's not an abstract class, we can call it a concrete class. Or actually, let's do better than that. 
let's make a pet. Let's talk about a pet class. And we have dog and cat. Now I can do everything with the abstract class except one thing. I can define attributes. You know, what do all pets have in common? Well, they have a name, they have a birthday, maybe some other things. All right. What are behaviors that pets have? Well, they get shots at the vet, you know, and so on and so forth. All right. But what I cannot do in code is do this. You cannot say new pet. You have to specify what kind of pet that is. <coughs> yes. I could do this, correct. Pet P equals new dog. That's, <coughs> that's legal. <coughs> Because no one in the world just has a pet. They have a dog or a cat or whatever. <clears throat> now let's consider our library materials class that we talked about before. I said that that's an abstract class and we could inherit book and DVD let's say, from it. Now again, because it's an abstract class, we cannot say library material L equals new library material. Not allowed, because that's an abstract class. I could say library material L equals new book. And that's allowable. Other than that, an abstract class, you can have everything that is in a concrete class. You can have methods and you can have attributes. Yes? Yes, that would give you an error. It would tell you that you cannot instantiate an abstract class. So it's, it's not like it's like a bad idea to do it. You just can't do it. The compiler won't allow you to do it. Yes? Did you have a question? You, you define it as an abstract class when you define it? I mean, like it's yes. Oh, so you say abstract. Okay. That, that's, I don't know why. Yes. I was thinking I should look that up. Yeah, it... Um, let me pull up an example real quick. Thank you. So instead of just saying public class, we say public abstract class. All right. We can also make abstract methods. Now what's an abstract method? An abstract method is where the specifics of the method vary for each subclass, but we know that every subclass has to have this method. For example, great example in our library material one, I could define calc fine and 
and I could define it as an abstract class. What does that mean? It means that there's no default method for calculating a fine. Every div, but I do know that every library material that I've created has a calc fine method. All right? So I don't know what that is. There's no default. We're not going to inherit it. But I must, when I create a subclass of library material, create a calc fine method. All right? I have to do that. So I may not know. I may not know what the calculate fine method is. Maybe for a DVD, it's you know five dollars plus a dollar a day. Maybe for a book, it's twenty-five cents a day. Maybe for some other material, you know who knows? There's there's some other rule for calculating it. But when I declare an abstract method, every class that extends that 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 uh, that, that superclass has to define that abstract method. You know, going back to our pet example, get food. You know, what does this pet eat? Get food. Is there a default for pets that you could feed every single pet? I don't think so. I don't want to think and I don't want to speculate about that. All right? You know, dogs eat dog food, cats eat cat food. Well, that's not really a food. Um, fish eat worms. Um, lizards eat crickets. Um, snakes eat mice, which is gross. <laughs> and so on, right? But there's no default that I can say this is a default food for pets. And I'm going to override it for snakes because they don't eat the generic pet food. They eat mice. No. Every pet has its own food. I know for sure that every pet has some kind of food that they eat. So I could create an abstract method in my pet class that was get food that displayed a list of the things that the animal ate. However, when I extended that class and created subclasses for it, I would need to override that method and say specifically, what does a dog eat? What does a cat eat? What do fish eat? What do snakes eat? And so on down the line. So that's an abstract method. All right? I can have in an abstract class a mix of regular methods and abstract methods. For example, calculate age of a pet, right? If I have a birth date as an attribute in the pet class, I could write a calculate age method here. Because the method for calculating an age for a cat is the same as calculating the age for a dog, or for a fish, or for a snake. You look at what day today is, you look at the date it was born, and you do some math. And you figure out that this dog is five years old, or whatever. So I can write a generic method for calculating the age of a pet. Every pet has a birthday, and I could... Um, write code that took the birthday, took the current date, calculated how old it was, and return and say, that's the age of the pet. All right? Get food is something I cannot write a generic function for, because every type of pet has its own kind of food. So I would declare that as an abstract method. OK. So where do... And with abstract methods, by the way, you don't define any code. You just define the signature of the method. So let's look up
Here's an example of an abstract method. There's no code in it, you just define the signature of the function. Public abstract returns an integer, it's called sum of two, and it takes two arguments, two integers as arguments. Now, what does this have to do with an interface? An interface is different from an abstract class with abstract methods in a couple different ways. First of all, interfaces only have abstract methods. So you can't write any code in an interface. Interfaces also don't have any attributes. Like abstract classes, you can't instantiate an interface. You have to instantiate a specific concrete object. Now here's the catch, and here's the benefit of interfaces. And I've kind of foreshadowed it with my discussion of multiple inheritance. The big advantage of interfaces is that an individual class can implement multiple interfaces. All right? Can, can, can implement multiple interfaces. Now let's talk about the benefit that we get from interfaces versus the benefits that we get from inheritance. All right? And let's look at our library example to discuss the benefits that we get from the benefits that we get from inheritance. Let's say I have my library material class, and I have two subclasses, a DVD and a book. And right now, let's just talk about two methods in the library materials class. Calc, how many days checked out? Then calculate fine. If I were to tell you one of these methods would have to be or could be a concrete method and the other one would have to be an abstract method, which do you think is the abstract method and which do you think the concrete method would be? Which of the two do you think the abstract method would be? Calculate fine would be the abstract method. Calculate how many days checked out. You could code that in the library materials class. Why? Well, because you have a checked in at, or checked out attribute, which is a date. You have that attribute in that class. You could look at the current date, and you could do the calculation and say, okay, it was checked out October 2nd, and today's November 2nd. It's been out for 31 days. Doesn't matter what we're talking about, a book, a DVD, a scroll, anything. It's been checked out for 31 days. If I know that a library material was checked out on this date, it doesn't matter, that doesn't affect the kind of calculation. So therefore, I don't have to override this method 
in these classes. So that's a benefit of inheritance. I can define the logic, I can define programming logic in a superclass, and I don't have to define that logic in a specific subclass. All right? I only have to code the differences. I only have to code where it's different. All right? So that's one advantage of inheritance, is when you declare a function in a superclass, the subclasses get that function for free. And you don't have to recode that function unless there's something different for that particular subclass. And if you're talking about calculating the date or calculating how many days checked out, well, again, it really doesn't matter what we've checked out. If we, if we know the data was checked out, we can calculate how many days it's been checked out. That doesn't matter if we're talking about a DVD or, or anything else. Calculate fine, on the other hand, there is no generic way to calculate a fine. All right? Right? We define different rules for the different items. For some, there was a fine plus a certain daily fine. For some, it was just a daily fine. We could come up with all sorts of rules that, uh, of how you calculate the fine. And there is no default rule that says, well, for all library materials, it's a quarter a day, except new DVDs are a dollar a day. There isn't any kind of rhyme or reason with this. All right? It's not like everything's one way as a certain default, and one case is different. Each one of these cases has its own way of calculating the fine. Therefore, I cannot really define a default calculate fine method in that class. But one thing I know for sure, right? What I know for sure is that every library material needs to have a method to calculate fine. All right? Why is that important to know? Because I want to be able to ask every library material I'm going to have an array list of library materials, all right? I need to be able to ask every library material I have what the fine is. So I need to ensure that that method is defined on this level. Even though there isn't concrete code for it on this level. But I do have to guarantee that every library material subclass has some way of calculating the fine. And the way you do that is by putting in an abstract class. Or, I'm sorry, as you put that in as an abstract method. If you put it in as an abstract method, then every subclass has to have a concrete implementation of the calculate fine function. It has to, otherwise you get a compile error. So if I define this as an abstract function, then every subclass has to have it. Now if I can guarantee that, that every subclass has it, I don't get the benefit of reusing code, because I can't write a generic calculate find method, but I do get the benefit of polymorphism. And that's a huge benefit. What's the benefit of polymorphism? That I can call a method on a particular class and I will get the right version of that method for the specific class I'm dealing with. So I could, for example, create an array list of library materials. Let's call it A. And I could loop through that list. And I could grab each library material.
We've all seen code like that. And I can say L.calcfine. All right. How can I say that? I can say that because calculate fine was declared as an abstract function in library materials. Because it's an abstract function, I have to create the specific concrete function in each of the subclasses. But I know, I'm guaranteed by the compiler that every library material will have a calc fine function. So I can call the calc fine function. Even though that function wasn't defined at that level, and the library material level, the notion of polymorphism means that we will get the books calculate fine method, or we will get the DVDs calculate fine method, all right, or any other library materials calc fine method. Now, when we define that something's an abstract function, we are promising the compiler that every subclass is going to have that function defined. And not defined again as just an abstract class, but defined as a concrete class. So we've promised it. We've promised the compiler there's going to be a calc find method on every subclass of library material. What do you suppose happens if we break our promise to the compiler? Is the compiler going to be happy? No pretty safe bet, right? What happens when the compiler is not happy? It, spit, it blows up. It spits out error messages and you can't compile. So this isn't a runtime error or anything. You can't compile it because you promise that everything that inherits from this class has that method in there and you broke your promise. All right, so that's abstract classes and abstract methods. Interfaces are like that as well, except interfaces have no attributes. Interfaces only have abstract classes. I'm sorry, abstract methods. And a, a class can implement a number of interfaces. So let's talk about creating an interface for email recipient. All right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create three classes. And they're not going to inherit from each other because there is no is a test here. I'm going to create faculty, student, and vendor. Faculty is going to have the faculty ID number, the first name, and the last name. Student is going to have as an attribute the student ID number, first name, and last name. Vendor is going to have the vendor ID, the name of the vendor, and an email address. All right. Now, faculty, student, and vendors are all people I want to send emails to. But again, I don't want to create an abstract class and inherit from that because that seems a pretty weak is a relationship. It's not really a lot to tie these classes together. All right? So I'm going to create an interface. I'm going to create an, an email recipient interface. All right. Let's say that for the faculty, the email address is this. It's your first name, followed by your last name, at lorraineccc.edu. That's the rule for faculty's email addresses. First name, last name, at lorraineccc.edu. Let's say for students, the rule is this. The last name plus the student ID 
at lorraineccc.edu. So let's say that is the rule for students. That's how their emails are constructed. And finally, let's say that for vendors, well, vendors' email addresses can be constructed with no rhyme or reason. So we're just going to have that as an attribute in the vendor class. So these three entities have different rules for what their email address is. But one thing we can say for sure, all of these entities, there is a way of getting their email addresses. There's a way of getting, there's a method for getting their email addresses. So in my email recipient class, I'm going to create one method, get email address. And that's going to return a string. Now, if I ask a faculty person for their email address, it's going to take their first name and last name, put them together, slap at lorraineccc.edu at the end of it. And that's going to be their email address. If I ask a student, they're going to take their last name, add the student ID number to it, and add at lorraineccc.edu on the end of it. If I ask a vendor, it's simply going to return the value for the email attribute. Each one of these has its different way of calculating, if you will, the email address, coming up with the email address. Just like every flying thing, for example, what do every flying thing, what do all flying things have in common? Maybe the, the top speed that they can fly at. And maybe the, um, the, the top height that it can fly to. All flying things, I should be able to ask that, right? A kite, how high can a fl kite fly? Well, how big is your, how many feet is the, the, the spool of string? That's how high a kite can fly, right? How high can a airplane fly? I'm sure it depends on the kind of the airplane it is and what kind of engines it has and a number of other factors. How high can an eagle fly? Probably depends on maybe the age of the eagle, the size of the eagle, the wingspan, and other things. So anything that flies, there's probably someone that could calculate a formula that says, well, this is as high as an eagle can fly, based on parameters that are in for uh, an eagle. Likewise, with an airplane, it might depend on the kinds of engines and so on and so forth. So the way that they determine how high each of these flying things is going to be different but I know for every single flying thing, I should be able to ask the question, how high can you fly? And it should be able to give me an answer. Same thing here. The way that I come up with the email is different in all three of these cases. Yet I know for sure every one of these entities has an email address. And I should be able to ask them, give me your email address. All right? By the way, in the case of, of UML, um, a interface is shown as a dashed line. All right, so that would be my little OO diagram for this example, be a dashed line. So let me go in and let me create my interface.
public interface email recipient. All right. So, well, can't see that. Public interface email recipient. All right. As opposed to public class, whatever. All right. Public string get email address. All right. Notice that there's no code here, right? This is like an abstract method. We don't define code on an interface. All right. We don't define code on an interface. We simply define the signature of the function. Now, we could have more than one of these. For example, maybe there would be um, get email greeting, like dear Joe, dear, um, you know, Jenkins supply, dear whatever. All right? But for now, we're going to just stick with one. So this is our interface. Save it as email recipient dot Java. All right. So let's go and create our new class. I'm going to start with a class for faculty. Now, this doesn't inherit from the email recipient, all right? This implements that interface, and therefore, you specify implements email recipient. What does it mean when we say that we're implementing the email recipient interface? We are promising the compiler that there will be what method? Get string, uh, a string method that returns a string that says get email address. So let's go and let's create this method and let's lie to the compiler and not put this method in here. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a couple of attributes, private, string, first, private, string, last. I'm going to create a, I don't want these here, I'm sorry. should be in my faculty class. I'm going to create my constructor. First equals arg first, last equals arg last. Now, I'm going to save this here. And I'm going to break my promise to the compiler. I'm 
What promise am I breaking to the compiler? I promise that this guy is going to implement the email recipient interface. What does it mean when I promise to implement the interface? It means that all of the methods that I've defined in the interface are going to be put into the faculty class. So I haven't put that get email address in there yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close out of this. I'm going to try to compile. Now, if I try to compile this, I haven't made any other typos. All right, I did. Forgot the semicolon. Forgot to say this guy was a string. Oh, <laughs> and I typoed this. All right. Promise you this will be the last of my unintentional errors and we'll only see my intentional error. Ah. There we go. This is what happens when you break your promise to a compiler. It gives you this compiler error. And let's see what it says. It says, faculty is not abstract and does not override abstract method get email address in email recipient. So what that's telling me is email recipient is an interface. Remember, an interface is like an abstract class. All right? And all its methods are abstract. And if you implement that interface, you have promised that you are going to have a function, name this, that returns that with these arguments. So if I fix that, how do I fix that? I will put in public string get email address. And I will return, what did I say their email was? Their first name plus their last name plus the string at lorraineccc.edu. Now we have fulfilled that promise so it doesn't complain about that. We don't really see the benefits of interface by just creating one class. You will see the benefits of interface when we go in and create the other two classes. We create students and we create vendors and we give our own methods for, uh, for uh, getting email address. We can then have a list of email recipients that can be a mix of students, faculty, and vendors, and we can ask every member of that list, give me your email address. And it will call the right method depending on what class that member of that list happens to be. We can only do that by creating an interface, either an interface or inheritance. And we already decided inheritance isn't suitable for this problem. So by creating an interface, we can then use polymorphism where it doesn't matter what all those different things are in our list of email recipients. If they all correctly implement that email recipient interface, then we can ask each of them, what is your email address? 
and it will go through whatever procedure it needs to do to come up with the email address for that party and return it. And so then we could generate emails, let's say. So if we had a mass emailing thing that looked at every student, faculty, and vendor, we could send uh, an email to. That's what we'll pick up on next time. All right? We'll see you up in lab then.